This place is visited by thousands of Australian pilgrims every year. Yet it's not a church. It's forever consecrated in the hearts of Australians. Yet it's not Australian soil. It is Australia's most important military victory, yet it's relatively unknown. This is Owers Corner in the foothills of the Owen Stanley mountain range, about 50 kilometres from Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea. For many brave men, this was their last contact with civilization. Owers Corner is the southern end of the Kokoda Track. For almost 100 kilometres, it winds its path through some of the most rugged and isolated terrain on Earth. Here, a ragtag group of young Australian men fought a series of desperate and vicious battles. Many gave their lives for the freedom of Australia. This is their story. We're going to look at the importance and symbolism of the Kokoda campaign and what we can learn from it personally. Today, the Owen Stanley Mountain Range and the Kokoda Track look peaceful and serene. It's hard to imagine that for Australia, this track was the scene of one of the bloodiest campaigns of World War II, and that what young Australians did here changed the course of the war and probably saved Australia. In February 1942, Japanese Prime Minister Tojo stated the Japanese policy was to crush Australia. The forces of Imperial Japan had advanced victoriously through southwestern Asia. And after the fall of Singapore in February 1942, Australia was effectively isolated. Japanese forces bombed Darwin and planned a naval attack to capture Port Moresby and make Australia extremely vulnerable. But the American naval victories in the Battle of the Coral Sea in early May and at Midway in early June had broken the dominance of the Japanese Navy in the Pacific. Japan's goal was still to establish a stronghold in Port Moresby. And if it couldn't do it through its Navy, it would do it through its Army, marching overland along the Kokoda Track and across the Owen Stanley Ranges from the northern shore of Papua New Guinea. If they succeeded in this and established a base in Port Moresby, the Australian mainland would have come under dire threat. The Kokoda Track or Trail was a precarious jungle path that ran for about 100 kilometres from here at Owers Corner near Port Moresby over the rugged Owen Stanley mountain range to the small village of Wairopi on the north side of the mountains linking a number of native villages along the way, including Manari, Ifogi, Ishurava, Deniki, Gorari, and Kokoda. Well, we're on the Kokoda track, following in the footsteps of the Marubra Force, and we're experiencing just a little of the hellish conditions of the mud, rain, mosquitoes, leeches, and steep terrain that they endured. The members of the Marubra force were called Chocos or chocolate soldiers. And that's because they were undertrained conscripts. And it was thought that they would melt like chocolate in the heat of battle or at the first sight of the Japanese. Unknown to them, the Japanese had already landed on the 21st of July, 1942, here in the Ghana Sanananda region on the northern coast of New Guinea. And here they established a strong defensive position. The initial Japanese landing force consisted of 2,300 men, including a crack company of Marines. Their orders were to establish a beachhead here and then move inland and secure Kokoda, where importantly there was an aerodrome, the only one between the north coast and Port Moresby. Their orders were then to cross the Owen Stanley Range along the Kokoda Track, 
while building a road for the Japanese forces who would follow along behind. It was an audacious plan, and they were determined to carry it out. But they hadn't counted on the toughness, bravery, and fighting ability of the Australians. Here, near the village of Awala, was where the first clash occurred on the 23rd of July. Incredibly, it was here that a platoon from B Company of the 39th Battalion, consisting of only 75 men, engaged the advancing Japanese force that was 2,500 strong. B Company was led by Sam Templeton, a 41-year-old career soldier. Under his command, B Company fought a valiant defensive action. They alternated ambushing the advancing Japanese with strategically retreating to the high ground at Oivi. And they managed to alert the rest of the 39th to the presence of the enemy. In fact, the Australians resisted so strongly that the Japanese were convinced that they were facing a force of 1,200 strong, when in fact, they were facing under 100 young Australian men. On the 27th of July, Captain Templeton was reported missing. He'd been wounded, captured, and about a week later, he was executed. However, under interrogation before his death, Captain Templeton convinced the Japanese that there were 20,000 Australian and US soldiers waiting for them at Port Moresby although the reality was that there were far, far fewer. In fact, Captain Templeton was convincing enough that the Japanese halted their advance for two weeks, which allowed the Australians to rush more troops into the battle. Without Captain Templeton's bravery and self-sacrifice, Port Moresby would have been lost and Australia itself would have been endangered. The village of Kokoda, on a plateau on the northeastern foothills of the Owen Stanley Range, is near the northern end of the Kokoda Track. It's this village that gives its name to the track that runs through it. From Awala, the 39th began a fighting retreat back here to Kokoda, where they dug in and prepared to defend the village together with its vital airfield. The fighting over Kokoda was fierce, but the Marubra force and what remained of the 39th and the Papuan Infantry Battalion were unable to hold it against overwhelming odds. But they were so determined that even after they'd lost the plateau, they went on to recapture it. But Japanese troops just kept pouring in and the remaining Australians were eventually driven back. The 39th had now been fighting continuously for a month, and the toll had been horrific. After the battles at Awala and Kokoda, the 39th Battalion could only muster a fighting force of around 30 men out of a nominal fighting force of around 700. The rest were either dead, missing, wounded, or in hospital suffering from disease and exhaustion. From Kokoda, the Australians fell back into a long fighting retreat along the Kokoda Track, across the Owen Stanley Range, determined to resist the Japanese advance as much as possible. The Kokoda Track is a living, breathing, pulsating path, surrounded by a seemingly impenetrable jungle of tropical rainforest, raging rivers, and stunning waterfalls. The track crosses deep into the steep, brooding, miscovered mountains and then sweeps down into beautiful, lush green mystical valleys. This sounds beautiful, but the reality on the ground was far different. It rained almost every day, and together with the heat, that meant incredible humidity. There are mosquitoes, leeches, and other parasites everywhere. The jungle here is so thick with vegetation and often mist that in many places, you can't see a person standing a meter away from you. Those who fought there 
remember spending most of their time waist deep in mud or crawling through the jungle. Those same veterans tell how they were so short of food that they used to throw grenades into the rivers and then dive in to grab the stunned fish so they could get a proper meal. These days, hundreds of Australians walk the single file Kokoda track every year, except they do it in the dry season. And walking might not be quite the right word to use to describe progress across the track. You have to pick your way along the track. Sometimes the climbing is so tough that you have to use your hands as well as your feet. The average human walking speed is around five or six kilometers per hour. But the speed along this track is two kilometers per hour. And in the worst sections, it gets as low as one kilometer an hour. Those Australians who walk the track each year find it heavy going. But each Australian soldier who walked the track to the battle had to carry 30 plus kilos of personal equipment, weapons and ammunition. By now, the Australians had been reinforced by the 53rd Battalion, the 21st Brigade and the headquarters of the 30th Brigade. However, there were now 10,000 Japanese pouring down the track and the Australians were outnumbered, outgunned and out-equipped. Painfully, the Australians continued their fighting withdrawal until they reached Isurava. Among the many acts of self-sacrificing valour and heroism that took place during this campaign, some of the greatest took place at Isurava. The Japanese were 2,500 strong and the Australians numbered only 400. It was a real David and Goliath battle of almost biblical proportions. When they reached Isurava, the decimated 39th had been ordered to withdraw. As they were doing so, the battle for Isurava began. A party of 30 wounded soldiers from the 39th were withdrawing and they were already some distance away from the front lines. But when they heard the noise of battle and knowing that their mates and friends were in strife, they just turned around and headed straight back to the battle. On the 26th of August, the fourth day of the battle, Japanese General Hori decided to launch a final massive attack on the Australian positions at dawn. From sunrise to sunset, the Japanese attacked in overwhelming numbers. In places, the battle had descended into hand-to-hand -hand combat. In one of the key Australian positions, the situation seemed hopeless and the Japanese were ready to overrun the whole battalion. The Australians were falling everywhere. The fire was so heavy that the undergrowth had been completely destroyed in five minutes. Corporal Lindsay Bear was manning a Bren machine gun and was weak from blood loss. Because of his wounds, Corporal Bear passed the gun to the man next to him, Private Bruce Kingsbury, of the 2nd 14th Australian Infantry Battalion. They were about to be annihilated. Private Kingsbury saw that drastic action was needed to save his mates, his friends. And so he took the Bren gun and calmly leapt up and firing the Bren gun from his hip, he charged the Japanese positions through a storm of machine gun fire. He cleared a path of 100 metres through the Japanese lines before being shot by a sniper. Later, his mate said that he'd thrown his life away to save theirs. Today, this place is called Kingsbury's Rock, the rock next to which Kingsbury died. Today, it's part of the Ishirava Memorial. Private Kingsbury's actions stopped the Japanese breakthrough. He single-handedly saved his battalion, and he gave renewed courage to the Australian forces. Kingsbury was awarded Australia's highest medal for bravery, the Victoria Cross, the first person to ever receive this honour on what was then technically Australian soil. The Australians had been fighting non-stop for four days at Isharava, 
and over 500 Japanese had been killed. But yet again, they were forced to withdraw in the face of overwhelming numbers. The withdrawal took place in nightmare conditions of mud, rain and total darkness. The modern day bushwalker can walk the same distance in an hour that the exhausted Australian soldiers carrying their wounded took all night to do. During this withdrawal, Captain Ben Buckler and the 41 men whom he led were cut off from the main Australian force. For six weeks, he led them through the rainforest. And because they were behind enemy lines, Buckler decided that the best option was to lead his men towards the northern coast. They were carrying a number of wounded men, but there weren't enough fit men to carry all the wounded. One of the wounded was Corporal John Metzen. He had been shot through both ankles, but he didn't want to slow down the group. So each morning, he would have his hands and knees bandaged and would set off before the main party crawling. And every night, he would arrive in the dark at that night's encampment. This amazing and continual self-sacrificial behavior allowed his mates to escape the Japanese patrols and continue their incredible six-week trek towards safety. But eventually, Captain Buckler's group became so weak that they couldn't carry all of the wounded. The decision was made to leave seven wounded soldiers at Sangai village, while the rest of the party went for help. A medical officer, Tom Fletcher, volunteered to stay with the wounded. When the rescue party eventually returned, they found that the Japanese had discovered the wounded men and shot them all dead in their stretchers, and that Fletcher's body was next to them. He could have saved himself, but Fletcher stayed to protect his friends. The desperately tired but determined force kept continually defending, retreating, and then counter-attacking. The men were racked by malaria and dysentery, but they kept on fighting ferociously until they came to Imata Ridge. It was here that the Australians absolutely had to make a final stand because they were virtually overlooking Port Moresby itself. It was the last natural defensive position before defeat. There was nowhere else to go. The Japanese held the opposite ridge at Iori Baiwa. This was the final showdown. But here at Imata Ridge, the Australians had prepared a last ditch surprise for the Japanese. The Australians had laboriously dragged 25 pounder guns up from Port Moresby and suddenly they opened fire on the Japanese positions. That was the turning point of the Kokoda campaign. The Australian shelling smashed the Japanese barricades and the Australians started patrolling aggressively. Iori Baiwa was as far as the Japanese advanced. From that time on, the Japanese began a long retreat back along the track, back to Kokoda and back to the sea, with the Australians pursuing them and attacking them the whole time. Now it was the turn of the Japanese to experience what the Australians had experienced during the preceding months. The Australians drove the Japanese back to the northern shore of Papua New Guinea. And by the 22nd of January, 1943, all organized resistance by the Japanese in Papua New Guinea had ceased. In the fierce, desperate battles along the Kokoda Track, Approximately 625 Australians were killed and 1,600 wounded. 6,000 Japanese soldiers were killed. Australian casualties due to sickness numbered more than 4,000. In fact, more Australians died in the months of fighting in Papua New Guinea than in any other campaign of World War II. The Kokoda campaign, with its blood, sweat and tears, with its heartbreak and its horrors, and with its self-sacrifice and victory, forever changed the destiny of Australia. The Australian victory on the Kokoda Track was the first time in the Second World War that the Japanese army was defeated and turned back. 
It was also the first and only military victory by the Australian Army on what was then technically Australian soil. The Kokoda campaign was certainly one of the most heroic defensive actions in history. Those who fought there have been called the men who saved Australia. Lieutenant Colonel Honor, who commanded the 39th in the campaign, later wrote of those men who survived, they have joined the immortals. And about those who did not survive, Honor wrote, wherever their bones may lie, the courage of heroes is consecrated in the hearts and engraved in the history of the free. Many of them lie here at the Bomana War Cemetery just near Port Moresby. For that reason, the legacy that those men have left us today is much more than simply an Australian nation that remained free. They embodied what Aussie mateship, friendship, is all about. These men were just regular blokes who became legends. And the legend of Kokoda is all about a nation of people who don't leave their mates, their friends behind, who stay with them till the end, and who are willing to put up their hand and say, pick me, and calmly walk out to give their lives for their mates, their friends. It's about real courage. It's about self-sacrifice so that others can be free. Our men at Kokoda represented the very best of not just Australian values, but the highest values of humanity as well. For that reason, in that ancient but always relevant book, the Bible, the following words were spoken by Jesus and found in John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you know, this is precisely the theme that is at the very heart of the Christian message. The Bible tells us about someone who was our best mate, our best friend, who when we were all in danger, sacrificed his life so that we could be free. The danger which we're all in is the danger of sin. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. But God couldn't leave us alone and so sent someone to be our mate, our friend, someone who wanted to put us first and who ended up giving us the ultimate demonstration of what self-sacrificing love is all about. And so the Bible explains that here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of friend, the kind of mate that Jesus is. When the odds were overwhelming, Jesus fought for us and He sacrificed His life for us. And because of that, listen to what the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The inspiring story of the young Australian soldiers who fought along the Kokoda track stands today as one of the most heroic defensive actions in history. They embodied what true friendship, mateship is all about. Their story is all about self-sacrifice so that others can be free. It's also a reminder of the kind of friend that Jesus is, how when the odds were overwhelming, Jesus fought for us. If you would like to find out more about the Anzacs and their experiences and their belief in God, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, The Faith of the Anzacs. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. 
There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make sure you take this opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. That's right, you can have today's offer completely free of charge and with absolutely no obligation. So don't delay. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or P.O. Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. We all walk on a track. And for us, it's not the Kokoda track. It's the track of life. We honour the heroes of the Kokoda campaign. So how much more should we honour Jesus? But after all he's done, so many people won't even give him a chance in their lives. But that doesn't have to be true for you. You can get to know Jesus as your best friend, your best mate of all. Why don't you give him a go and invite him into your life now as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for those brave men who sacrificed their lives long ago so that we might be free. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you because you sent Jesus Christ to this world when we were in danger, to look out for us, to be by our sides, and to sacrifice his life so that we might live. Thank you for the freedom and friendship he offers. Please help us to realize that our deepest need is for Jesus and help us to acknowledge what he's done and to recognize him as our best friend of all. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.